morning. Uh, good, uh, good, good morning. Good afternoon, go to. Uh, so just, a, just a quick question. Uh, how many people are using Kotlin now uh, at their jobs in production? Cool. How many people have not used Kotlin at all yet? Okay, cool, so good split. So my name is Wen Dao. Um, I'm an Android developer at Trello, and we've been using Kotlin on our team, well, I guess as long as I've been using Kotlin, about two and a half years. And for me, kind of like even though, um, you know, I feel like I'm getting to know Kotlin a little bit better after two and a half years, there's this question that I kind of still ask myself all the time, uh, and by the way, this entire talk is gonna be uh, live coded, we'll see how that goes. Um, and there's this question that I still ask myself, uh, and I I'm probably will continue to ask myself in the next two and a half to uh, however long we're using Kotlin, and that is what is idiomatic Kotlin? And I feel like I heard that phrase a lot when I was first using it, and I was like, okay, what, what, is, what does that mean? Like, what is Kotlin? Like, what is idiomatic Kotlin? Am I, am I doing it right? Am I, is, that, is that what I'm doing? And I think to answer this question, I kind of went to uh, some different places. You know, I looked on the web, I Googled, I kept reading the Kotlin code conventions, and I think one really valuable place for me to learn idiomatic Kotlin was kind of to look at the code that JetBrains wrote in the standard library. And I learned a lot actually about language features, like which, which ones exist, how to use them, I guess in different ways and conventions that JetBrains uses in their own standard lib. And I, I kind of hope that uh, one way of looking at idiomatic Kotlin is to look what JetBrains does. And that's what I wanna take you all through today is that uh, you know, maybe a good place to learn idiomatic Kotlin is in the standard library source. So that's what we're gonna do. So my first love in Kotlin was the collections API. So the Collections API, if y'all aren't familiar and haven't done any Kotlin yet, is basically this like, whole collection of out-of-the-box uh, utilities and operators that you can apply to kind of traditional collections. So collections, sets, maps. And what's really cool about it is that if you're someone who's done any RxJava or with Java 8 streams, you might recognize this very kind of familiar, uh, fluent, expressive syntax, and you can chain operations together. And it's a really just nice functional API for working with collections, and that's what's in Kotlin. And I think another thing that was interesting about Kotlin for me is that I've never really understood what, I've never really had much experience with functional programming. I still don't know quite what it is. I don't know what a monad is, but I do understand that kind of, part of the idea of functional programming and this functional API for collections in Kotlin is this ability to kind of, kind of express at a much higher level what we're trying to do in our code to, and you'll hear this phrase a lot, at least I come across this phrase a lot in my you know, Googling about functional programming, is that you focus on the what and not the how and evaluating expressions, you know, kind of high level concepts rather than you know, explicitly ex uh, exec executing statements, you know, kind of line by line, what am I doing? And if you're kind of interested in this, if you're like me, you're still kind of like a bumbling fawn in the world of functional programming, there is an amazing book. Uh, it is Java-based, but it's still a really great intro to functional programming, programming, programming concepts, kind of in this vein of thinking about it in terms of like collections and, and kind of like uh, streamy type uh, writing uh, by Venkat Subramaniam, who is an amazing writer, speaker, educator, anything that Venkat produces, I consume uh, readily and similarly with functional programming, you should definitely check it out. I won't talk about that today though, but I will give an example. All right, so, oops. So say that, uh, say that I'm on a voyage of discovery, right? I'm an intrepid crew of scientists and adventurers and some possibly crazy captain off to boldly explore you know, new life and new civilizations. And occasionally on this mission of discovery, I have to take away missions off to a planet. Maybe I'm picking up resources, maybe I'm rescuing someone, but I have to go on these away missions. Now, away missions can be complicated, they can be dangerous, so we need the right group of people. So how do I find this you know, group of people, this, this members of my crew that are able to go on this away mission? Well, I might write a Kotlin function to figure that out. And maybe you know, for my away mission, I might need someone, you know, good leader, someone from the command deck. So maybe I need an impetuous captain or an enigmatic, enigmatic, enigmatic science officer. So things might break on the away mission, so I need someone from engineering, but let's make sure we find an engineer who's not currently busy doing repairs. Away missions are dangerous, people might get hurt, so I might need a doctor. So let's go to the med bay, find a doctor. He might be a little bit ornery, but damn it, he's not a mechanic. And finally, we need some people to round out the group. Uh, generally, these folks wear red shirts, and often they tend to die, but we still kind of need them to kind of fill out the group. So let's make sure that we find some of these red-shirted folks that aren't dead yet, and add them to the crew. Again, away, away missions are dangerous, so let's make sure that we only take experienced people, so we want to filter, uh, only take folks above a certain rank, and because why the heck not, let's figure out a marching order for these folks. Let's sort them by rank, just figure out who goes, uh, leaves the ship first. 
So I just told you a bunch of stuff, right? I described to you what I wanted, and while it was kind of complicated, there's a lot going on, if you look at the code, you can see kind of what I just told you very easily in this functional, you know, expressive API. And I think that's one of the, again, one of the things that I fell in love with about Kotlin and the standard library. And I think it's something that I'm trying to emulate in my own code. Because I feel like there's got to be something, some of the goals and values of the JetBrains team kind of in how they design this API. So in this journey towards more idiomatic Kotlin and writing my own kind of cool, interesting things, I kind of like said, okay, well, let's drill in and see what's, what's, what's kind of all about, what's, what's in these, you know, functional APIs, so what's that magic that makes them kind of delightful to use? And I'm gonna talk about some of these things that we're seeing here. So this, I've drilled into the filter function, and there's a couple of interesting things to note here. So filter has some interesting things, like so if you're from JVM world, the signature kind of looks similar, there's got, uh, we've got some generics in here. I've got this interesting syntax where I have this iterable type, but it's preceding the function name, that might be relevant later. Uh, you'll see this a lot in these standard lib methods where we have a function type, uh, basically defining you know, a function that takes in a parameter of type T and returns a Boolean. And there's this inline keyword. There's a lot of interesting stuff here. So what can we learn about Kotlin and what we can do with it by taking a look at some of these little features? So if you look at the standard lib, a lot of these functions are higher order functions. And if you're like me and you didn't really know much about functional programming, you might be asking, what does that mean? Well, a lot of times you'll hear you know, people when they talk about, say, functional languages or functional programming, talk about languages that uh, treat uh, functions as first-class citizens or that have first-class functions. So what does that mean? So when you have a higher order function, when you have a language that treats functions as first-class citizens, that means that you can, number one, store functions in variables, so you can uh, pass them around like values. You can pass functions as parameters to other functions, and you can return functions from other functions. So basically, functions can act just like a string or like an integer, they can be passed around. And kind of part of this system is this idea of function literal, so functions as expressions. And uh, Kotlin has a few different flavors of function literals. Uh, if I can scroll down, there we go. So the first one that has a name that you might hear often in related, uh, related to functional programming things is lambdas. So I looked this up and I swear this is, this is actually a definition I read on something fairly official that lambdas are a chunk of code in curly braces, that's it. Now this chunk of, <laughs> this chunk of code in curly braces does in fact look a bit functiony. There, I just made that word up, functiony. It looks function-esque, we'll say that, a little more sophisticated. So it has a parameter list uh, with a bunch of parameter names and types. It has a right arrow, and following the right arrow is the actual body of our function uh, literal. So I have here a couple of lambdas. I've assigned them to immutable vals, so they're stored inside of kind of basically constant, constant values. I have one that uh, determines whether a string is a palindrome. I have one that determines whether an integer is even. And I have a function here for determining whether, uh, determining what the uh, median of an array of integers is. I'm just gonna remove that just for, uh, anyway. So there's a couple of interesting things to note about lambdas. So number one, there's no return type. So usually when we declare functions uh, in our kind of like uh, either Java or something, uh, C++ kind of type languages, we specify return type. Lambdas don't have return types. Generally what happens is they infer the return type based on the last evaluated expression. So here in my first two functions, I, in both they have a single line, they're evaluating kind of like um, some equality. And so that returns a Boolean. So the return type of this lambda is a Boolean. In my median of function, or lambda rather, it's a little more complicated. Um, and this is not great code if, uh, if you're confused as I am when writing a lambda like this, it probably isn't a good lambda. But as you can see here, depending on what, which branch I take in my median of lambda, I return either a zero if the array is empty, first if it only has one, and then some other kind of uh, evaluations. And the comp column compiler basically infers based on, you know, kind of like the common type of, of these possible return expressions, what the return type of that function literal is. So a couple other interesting things about lambdas is that, okay, um, say I look at this, and knowing me, I really kind of prefer, I, I'm not the kind of person that likes this kind of figuring out what the last expression is. I really want to just type in the return. Now, I'm getting a compiler error here, is, uh, and the reason for that is that Kotlin does not allow what are called non-local returns inside of lambdas. So the return keyword in Kotlin very specifically returns from the kind of closest 
uh, enclosing function scope, and that's literally something defined with the fun keyword. And that the reason for that is is kind of a, uh, as part of the Kotlin story is Java inter interoperability, and as part of that is say, well, you think about a for loop, right? If you have a for loop, what happens if you return out of if you execute return in that for loop? You don't just exit out of that loop, you exit out of the enclosing function. And that kind of behavior was mirrored in Kotlin, so that's why this is a non-local return because it's returning not out of this lambda, but out of the enclosing function. And it's not allowed here um, for different reasons, but mainly because if you are allowing functions to get passed around and stored in variables and possibly get called later, if that function that we're declaring here gets called later, what is it returning from? Because the execution context where this lambda was declared might be gone. Maybe it has a different signature. We don't know. So that's why non-local returns are not allowed here. So am I stuck with this confusing to me uh, expression retur last uh, return value uh, inference? I'm not. So what I can do in Kotlin is actually assign a label to a block of code. And I can do a local return by kind of uh, writing uh, return and then adding a return label. Um, again, if you're doing multiple returns, that's probably a little bit of a code smell, but if you're like me and you want to be more explicit about it uh, and it doesn't seem like too stinky of code, you can do that. Uh, something else that is also really handy if you don't like this syntax is that the IDE and IntelliJ or Android Studio for an Android person provides you a lot of help and you can actually have the IDE kind of hint to you where the return statements are and also uh, which you really should do, because um, I know this has really uh, tripped me up, is allow it to kind of hint to you, again, what the types of things are. Just because there is so much inference in Kotlin, if you're not specifying explicitly, it can get confusing. So, anonymous functions are another flavor of function literal uh, in Kotlin. So I have here a lambda, the is cur file, and then the is character file is an anonymous function. So these functions are pretty silly. <laughs> they basically just check the extension of a file and check if it's a character file, if it ends in .chr. So as you can see, I want to turn off the property hints real quick. Okay. So the interesting thing about anonymous functions is that they are declared similar to kind of regular uh, function declarations where you have the fun keyword, but they omit the function name. And while they are still kind of function declarations, they do have a return type. And because of this, because they actually use the word fun keyword to be declared, you can do a local return because you're returning from that local kind of function uh, scope. And that's basically it. You can see here it gets stored in a immutable value just like the lambda. Uh, I think they're really interesting. And also I like the idea that you know they explicitly specify the return uh, type. Although to be honest with you, in my kind of two and a half years of using Kotlin, I have never ever used an anonymous function at work. I'm sure there's a really good reason to use one. I just haven't encountered it. So if you have an idea for when you would use an anonymous function versus a lambda, please let me know. I am super interested. All right, so we have this language that allows for treating functions as uh, first-class citizens. It's still kind of a JVM language. It spits out Java bytecode. So what exactly is this magic that Kotlin is doing to allow us to kind of pass functions around like this? Well, to answer that question, I like to take what I like to call a b -b bytecode break, and we're going to take a look at some of that Java bytecode that Kotlin spits out and see what's going on under the hood. So if I go to a separate example, where are we? Right here. All right, so here's a really simple lambda. It's a lambda that calculates the average of two integers. That's it. Now, if I look into the Kotlin bytecode, I'm gonna pull it out here. I really have a hard time reading uh, bytecode, but I'm gonna kind of soldier through right now. And if I scroll through and scroll through, here's something that might look familiar. So whenever you create a lambda, that lambda is compiled into an internal class. So as you can see here, that average lambda is turned into an average class. And this class actually extends among other things, this uh, function to interface. So it's a function that takes two parameters and spits out a, uh, I think a float. So if I scroll down a little bit to this invoke method, I can see that I can kind of start to see in the machine code or the bytecode rather, uh, some things that might look like they're calculating an average. Loading two integers, adding them together, turning them to a float, uh, loading a double constant, multiplying them together. Okay, here's my actual average function my average logic. And if I scroll down a little bit, something that we're going to care about in a little bit, uh, in just a few minutes, is this. So this is a static instance of that internal class, that average class. And there, so it's a singleton. So whenever I'm calling this, whenever I'm invoking this lambda, aver or a lambda average uh, function literal, I'm actually calling into this instance. Okay. 
So as you can see, there's not a lot of magic here. These are basically just function objects that Kotlin translates from the nice Kotlin syntax into Java bytecode code for us. And by the way, if you're kind of interested in this stuff and you're interested in how kind of Kotlin kind of translates between you know, its syntax and Java bytecode, there are some really great tips, to, uh, really great talks by uh, an Android dev named Victoria Ganda. If it wasn't for, for Victoria, I would not know what any of this is. Um, so please check out her talks. Ooh, something else that's interesting. So as I mentioned, I'm kind of a chicken when, when, when it comes to reading code. So I'll often decompile down to Java. Uh, from the Java bytecode, just to kind of see like what is really going on under the hood. Oops, let me go back to my this class. Now, something interesting that you'll see if you're looking at a class uh, with a lambda in it and you decompile back to Java is this null.instance. So there's something null that has an instance. Now, what happens here is if you see this, is that the decompiler for brevity will often kind of omit the names of those internal classes that, get gen that gets generated and it comes out as null. But this is that singular instance that we saw uh, in the bytecode of our lambda. So just in case you see that. So back to higher order functions. So we talked about passing functions around as values. Let's, let's talk about how we pass them around as parameters or return them as uh, values from functions. So we're devs. Um, at least I, I assume a lot of us are, sorry, assumptions about who people are, but uh, I'm a dev. I tend to uh, do a lot of event tracking. Uh, and sometimes depending on you know, what I'm doing, I might want to you know, send a tracking event from my app to maybe to log if I'm debugging, maybe to file, maybe to the cloud if I'm kind of trying to aggregate some you know, uh, events for analytics or something. I might do something like this, for example. Say I have different destinations where I want to send my tracking events. To encapsulate that, maybe I'll write three lambdas, uh, one that tracks to a log, one that tracks to a file, and one that tracks to the cloud. Now, here are two higher order functions that kind of play around with these you know, tracking uh, function types. So say that for kind of my, uh, uh, the person that's consuming whatever this uh, code is, that for, for their ease, instead of making them call a specific lambda, I have an enum that defines these different destinations. And I have this higher order function that returns a function that maps from this, these enum values to a specific lambda. And then I might have somewhere else a higher order function like this that takes in that function type as a parameter and allows me to you know, just get some tracker function, I don't care what, and be able to call that and pass in parameters to it. So kind of some interesting things. When you're calling a function value, there's a couple ways you can do it. So number one is kind of a familiar you know, function name, except here it's a parameter value name. Uh, and then parentheses and then parameter list. But you can also go ahead and call invoke on that kind of function, uh, function typed value. And this invoke is that invoke that we just saw in the bytecode. And you can also pass parameters that way. Um, it's kind of your preference. I often very, I very often these days will explicitly uh, call invoke if I want to be really explicit that this is a function inside of a value or variable instead of just kind of like a actual declared function, but that's up to you. And again, there's kind of really neat things about the IDE that can help you if you want to just very quickly switch because you're not sure. Um, there are a lot of intent actions that can help you kind of uh, quickly refactor your code. So another thing that's great about Kotlin is it's not just function literals that kind of get the fun of higher order kind of functions. Uh, you can actually do it with declared functions. So if I take my three functions here, and let's say that, I mean, having them as lambdas, I might be a little bit silly. Let's go ahead and turn them uh, back into declared functions by doing this. All right, and we'll change this back to, oops, three functions. So I have three declared functions now. Now my kind of like my mapping function is unhappy because rather than having actual values here, I've got these like, you know, kind of orphaned symbol names. What I can do is I don't have to turn these into function literals to pass them around. I can use a function reference syntax and Kotlin will basically allow me to pass references to declared functions as if they were kind of, you know, just lambdas or anonymous functions floating around. Something else that is really cool in, uh, with kind of the kind of function type handling in Kotlin. So higher order functions, awesome. So there are some, a set of really cool higher order functions in the standard lib that I've heard referred to as standard extensions, but I believe uh, some of the kind of newer uh, learning material from JetBrains refers to as scope functions. And as their name suggests, they kind of allow you to play with scope and to kind of play around with, I guess, how you want to group your code logically or, or, or to kind of like, you know, align to different behaviors. But if you've been using Kotlin for some time, these are basically those functions apply, let, run, and with. 
And you kind of use these functions, again, to kind of play with scope, play with like kind of what the meaning of what you're doing is. So if I have, say, this member config object that I'm creating from a factory method, I might want to kind of initialize some values on it. I can use this apply scope function, and I can very directly assign properties on this member config object. If I am doing some things like initialization, but I have some side effecty things going on, like maybe I'm writing to a file or something, I can call also. Uh, to maybe like contain all these side effects. And if I want to run some things on an object uh, that are kind of like a certain maybe loading behavior I'm doing, I can call run and put that behavior in there. Now, um, I know for me personally, one of my big challenges in Kotlin is trying to figure out what to call when, like do I use apply, also let and run. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but if you are kind of always scratching your head about that like I am, there's a great talk by a friend of mine, Christina Lee, called Two Stones, One Bird, Implementation, Implementation Trade-Offs, where she discusses kind of her uh, philosophy and how she kind of chooses which, what to use when, and it's a really good talk, so you should check it out. So part of my study of Kotlin and trying to figure out what standard, uh, what the idiomatic Kotlin is rather, is looking at these functions and trying to figure out, okay, so I've got four of these things or five of these things, maybe even six, there's a lot, and I kind of wanted to figure out my, for myself, what do I use when? And part of me figuring that out was looking at those function signatures and asking some questions and trying to figure out, okay, what does this language feature, what does this particular structure, what does that mean and how does that translate to what kind of the code looks like when I'm using these um, uh, scope functions? So there's three questions I ask myself when looking at these and that are kind of, I think, good questions to ask when you're trying to understand these concepts. Now, if there's a couple uh, terms here that you don't understand, I promise I'll explain them in just a minute, but my three questions are this. Uh, so looking at these scope functions, I ask myself, one, is it an extension function? Two, does it return the receiver or a new value? And three, do you pass a lambda or a lambda with the receiver? So let's uh, really quick take a look at the source of these uh, scope functions. So this is pretty much the source. I'm leaving a few things out that I will explain later, but uh, these are just some of them. Um, and so I remember kind of first starting Kotlin, clicking through into the open, into the open source and seeing this. So that first question I ask, asked, uh, is this particular function an extension function? So if you're not familiar, this particular syntax here. So I've got a function name, but it's preceded by a type. Here's a generic type, but a type, and then a dot. This is, this, is basically apply, this is basically making apply an extension function of whatever that type T is. So if you see that, that is generally an extension function syntax. So the second question I ask myself is, does this function return the receiver or a new value? So the receiver is the this. So when you have an extension function like this, this uh, object here, this is gonna get called in an instance, and that instance is the this inside of this function, it's the receiver. And as you can see, some of these functions like apply and also return this, as opposed to say let or let's say, let's see run, where it's actually taking some function that I pass in, evaluating it and returning the um, result of that evaluation. So that's what I mean when I'm asking myself, is it returning receiver or is it returning a new value? And finally, I kind of look at the parameters that go into these scope functions and ask myself, is it a lambda or a lambda with receiver? So basically, if it's a lambda, generally speaking, it's gonna be a regular function type. It'll be a parameter list, a right arrow, and a return type. Now, if it's a lambda with receiver, we kind of see, again, this kind of same syntax where I have a type, which is also known as a receiver type, the dot, and then the parameter list. So that's a lambda with receiver. And that's kind of another way that I kind of classify these different scope functions, trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean and, and what does the syntax mean? So extensions. Now, if you're kind of JVME kind of background, uh, you might have written maybe thousands of string utilities in your life. I know I have. And this is actually one that I wrote for work. It basically strips out diacriticals, which you can kind of slightly and accurately think of as accent marks. So I wrote a function that kind of used some regex magic that I don't understand to strip out accent marks from some localized text to make search easier. And I actually wrote this. It's a public static uh, string utility. And as you may know, when you call like a utility like this in Java, you have this really not that great syntax where you have the name of the class containing your utility, dot, the name of the function, and you pass it in a argument. Well, okay, we can do a little bit better than that in uh, Kotlin. So what Kotlin extensions allow you to do is actually extend the functionality of classes without either having to own the class, without having to subclass it, and you can still use really nice intuitive or more intuitive syntax. 
So here's my diacriticals uh, removing function, but written as a Kotlin extension. So when you write a Kotlin extension, it's going to look something like this. You're going to have the fun click keyword. You're going to have that receiver type. So that's the this inside of your function, the class that you're trying to extend. You have a dot, and then you have the name of the function. And that's it. And again, the string, rather than being in an argument, is the this that I'm calling kind of any methods inside of my extension function with. And if I actually want to call that method, it looks something like this. And what's really cool is here, where I'm actually calling remove diacriticals, I call it as if it's like a method on that string class. But I don't own the string class. I'm not subclassing it. I just get to call a utility method on it as if it kind of did exist in the string class. And I think that's just really powerful. And, and I, I know like I've asked a lot of other kind of Kotlin devs, like what's your favorite thing in Kotlin? And it's extension functions. And it's this really great idea of adding functionality, getting great syntax, but also kind of either not mucking up your really nice kind of ab abstraction classes, and also again, not having to be reliant on interfaces and types or subclassing them. Sure. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's a good question. So when you write, actually, I'm gonna, I'll answer your question with a b -b byte code break, and we'll and I'll, I'll let you know. So, so, ex so extension functions are not the same as subclassing or subclassing, or not the same as actually uh, altering a class. And I'll give you an example, and I'll show you why because it has a lot to do with how they're implemented. So here is my same extension uh, function, uh, just with a different name for collisions. And if I look at the byte code. What I really, oh, I want to decompile again, because I'm a chicken. Uh, and I look at this uh, decompile bytecode, you can see basically minus some like extra parameter checking that this is pretty much the same public static function that I had before. So yes, there are visibility issues. When you write an extension function, you only have you know um, the same visibility as any other kind of like consumer of that class. You can't access any public variables. So that's kind of like, again, that's the ding on it. It's called an extension function, but really it's adding functionality rather than extending that class. So it's still really nice. it is really nice. No, but that, that is that is a good point, and that is something to be aware of when you do when you do write extension functions. That it's it kind of, it's almost like more focused on the utility part of it rather than actually exp expanding on the base class. But very good question. All right, and you know, just to kind of hammer the point home, I remember looking at all, like going through strings uh, utilities when I was first using Kotlin and seeing all this really great stuff with dealing with Unicode uh, code points and is null or empty, they're all done with extension functions. So just to give you an idea, you know, like, yeah, okay, it's kind of just, you can argue that it's just syntactic sugar that you get to call it with this syntax. But again, kind of understanding like, you know, how you can really better um, kind of organize your code and kind of, again, associate kind of like these, you know, added utilities and behaviors and still have this really nice intuitive syntax. Um, and not having to be reliant on subclassing and type interfaces can be really, you know, helpful. All right, lambdas with receivers. What the heck are those? Lambdas with receivers are actually super closely related to extension functions. Now, say that, um, you know, okay, let's go back and let's say I'm working for an unscrupulous company that likes to make IAIs and say that we're testing out some hardware and we need some users or test subjects, let's call them users, to test out our hardware. Now, I might have an AI that, you know, goes ahead and manages tests for me and say that rather than kind of always, you know, explicitly writing out all the statements I need to run a test, I might write some lambdas that encapsulate kind of different types of tests that I want to run. Now, assuming that I use integers to, as IDs for tests, which isn't great, but we're, what we're going to do, they're unscrupulous science company, what can you do? Um, maybe I have a particular test suite where I just run through a bunch of tests, just all in a loop. Or maybe I have a test where I run one test, uh, see if the subject passes, and then encourage the subject, maybe positive reinforcement, so, they can, so, they, so that they make sure that they buy that uh, kind of hardware that I've tested with them. Or maybe they don't uh, pass, maybe I'll just bake them a cake because, you know, maybe like, you know, positive uh, marketing and stuff. Um, I would rather have the cake in either case. But anyway, if I wanted to kind of encapsulate kind of these different things that I might do and have them kind of be actions that I can pass easily, I might write these two lambdas. Now down here, I have a higher order function that will maybe say run the test. So say I have some parameters, say the version type of my AI test runner, the name of my subject, I mean user, uh, that's going to be going through this test, and then some block. That's going to be that test suite, that bunch of behaviors that I want to execute with my AI and with my uh, test subject, I mean user. So if I'm actually calling this higher order function, it might look something like this. 
So as you can see, nothing too surprising. I call the method name, pass in the two parameters, and again, passing in the name of my uh, lambda that's been stored inside of a value, cool. And what's really cool about Kotlin is that also you can define lambdas in line. You're not kind of, you're not a uh, slave to say, sticking it in a variable first and then pulling it out later. You can very often define kind of function literals in line uh, in very neatly. And if you're really, really cute, there's this uh, shorthand in Kotlin where if you have a higher order function and a lambda is the last uh, parameter in the list, you can actually define that lambda on the outside of the parens. And I think that actually is a preferred convention. Lint will yell at you if you don't do that. Um, but anyway, okay, so this doesn't look too much different than what I had before. Uh, interesting, very functional. Um, but you know, I'm noticing something is that in these vowels, or sorry, in these vowels containing lambdas, and in the body, I'm calling tester dot a lot. Tester dot this, tester dot this, tester dot this, tester dot that. There's actually something I can do to make this a little bit better and cut down on the visual noise. And that's where lambdas with receivers come in. So when you have a lambda with receiver, you have a lambda, and it has multiple parameters, right? So what I do when I have a lambda with receiver is I'm taking one of these parameters and I'm actually giving it superpowers. I'm kind of, I like to say I'm elevating it. Um, and what happens is you take a parameter from that, from that lambda and you make it the receiver. You make it the this inside of that um, uh, function block. And rather than calling tester dot, tester dot, I can actually remove all of these like this. And now, because the tester that was a parameter is now the this inside, I can much more easily call these methods inside without any qualifications. Okay, so again, it seems like a little thing, but you know, how many times have you written like some initialization code or some other code where you're just calling methods on the same object over and over again? It kind of gets repetitive both for you as a developer and also, again, visual noise. And it's again playing with the idea of the scope functions as kind of creating this little scope, this little idea that, hey, I'm doing a bunch of things on this thing. And we can do that. We can kind of write our own versions of apply or let or with, sorry, apply or also this way. So what's really interesting is that, okay, I have these two now lambdas with receivers. Um, and I can actually change my higher order function here to take them in. And I can do that very easily with an IDE uh, intent action. And it actually allows me to select any parameter and then swap that into the receiver position. And what's interesting here is that um, so here I'm calling this block on this tester. So now that the tester is the receiver type, I can call the block as if it was, again, a method function or a method on that type. It's pretty interesting. So, okay, so I haven't convinced you why lambdas and lambda receivers and doing things this way are cool. Um, let me, let me uh, show you something else. So say in my kind of running my, my user testing on this AI, I have to activate the AI and then deactivate it later, okay? And it's something I do each time. Now, it's, it's fine, you know, if, as long as you remember to do it, the test will run successfully, but what if I wanted to abstract that away? What if I wanted to say, hey, um, I often forget to turn off my AI and we wanna be, you know, even though we're an unscrupulous AI company, we wanna make sure that we save, you know, the planet and conserve energy while we can. Well, I could do something like this with my higher order function where, I can actually abstract away what I love, what I have heard called, and I absolutely love called ceremony. So a lot of times when we're writing something, you know, we're using some resource, and we have to do a bunch of sh stuff at the beginning and a bunch of stuff at the end, and that is important stuff. But what we really care about, the critical logic, is the stuff in the middle. And we can use like lambdas and lambda receivers to abstract away what is, uh, I love being called ceremony, and then basically entrust that ceremony is done by this higher order function. So I don't have to call you know, this activate and deactivate. I can actually clean up my code even more, make it more readable, and kind of make it kind of more to the point, right? We, ha we kind of just c are concerned with what the actual thing is doing rather than the, the extra stuff. And this is called the execute around method pattern. It's something else that I learned from the awesome Venkat Subramaniam. And you can actually see it in a lot of places in the standard library. If you've ever kind of thought, if you've ever used uh, try with resources in Java, which you know, if you're working with input output streams, you have to open the stream, you have to close it. If the close exceptions, then you have to do more weird stuff. And a lot of that, again, is abstracted away using the try with resources construct. Um, Kotlin doesn't have that particular uh, functionality as a construct, but it is a uh, function, like a utility function in the standard library called use. And use, again, all that stuff with opening this file, closing this file, um, gets extracted away. We trust use to kind of manage that. And then we, in our little code block here, in this little lambda that we write, can just focus on, all right, what do you want to do with this file? 
which I think is really, really cool. And again, just kind of goes to this idea of Kotlin helping you write uh, more kind of readable, maintainable code. And if you have ever listened to the Kotlin uh, Conf 2018 keynote that was given by Andre Breslov, who leads the uh, Kotlin team, he had this great uh, kind of section where he talked about kind of the motivations and the values of Kotlin. And he said that one of their goals is to write a language that allows you to take your thoughts and translate them into working software. And I think this is kind of one of those, is kind of one of those values kind of like you know, in the flesh, so to speak, uh, in Kotlin. This idea that, okay, ceremony is there, it's perfunctory, but we can abstract it away and you can just focus on the thoughts, the actual kind of important part that you're trying to get from your head onto the screen. Uh, any Android people in the house? Cool. So there's a lot of this kind of execute around method in Android KTX, which you should totally take a look at and uh, use if you have used some of the awesome new uh, methods for making like fragment uh, transactions better. Those are kind of execute around method, and you'll see uh, lambdas and lambda receivers in them. Okay, so there's not that many Android people. I'm just going to skip over and talk about closures and captures. So, all right, we've got these really great lambdas and lambda receivers, and this kind of this whole great idea of treating functions as values and passing them around. Are there trade-offs? Yes. And to talk about that, let's talk about closures and captures. So uh, let's see. I, it took me a long time to grok, grok what a closure was, and I finally did. And if you, I think this is actually from Mozilla, but um, they define a closure as the combination of a function and the lexical environment within which that function was declared. And I still didn't quite understand that after reading that. But um, so basically, environment. Uh, so when you declare a function, the environment is basically kind of the local variables in scope to where that function was defined. And a function closes over those scoped values. So that's a closure. The function, as long as that's kind of environment of visible uh, values to it. And when a function actually reaches out and accesses one of those you know, closed over scoped values, those, are, those values are captured. Um, and this is related a lot to, say, like in Java, where you have an anonymous class that reaches out. Uh, those values have to be final because of the way that closures and captures are done in Java. But we're in Kotlin land. Let's talk about Kotlin. So let's talk about the costs that might be associated with using lambdas and lambda receivers and all this great uh, higher order function stuff. All right, we're back on our voyage of discovery. You know, things are going great. We're having a great time meeting new peoples and new civilizations when, oh shit, excuse me, I just swore. Um, <laughs> oh crap, something happened. We have, you know, uh, enemies on board. We have some kind of amazing artifact that could help them destroy the universe. Let's just blow up the ship. Let's just, let's, let's just get out of here. Well, if I wanted to uh, write uh, that particular sequence of the movie in Kotlin, I might have, say, something like this. All right, I have a ship computer. This ship computer is an object that has a run commands. Run commands is a higher order function. And it takes some function literal, some function, some but bunch of stuff that we want the computer to do and takes care of it. So if I wanted to initiate self-destruction and get everyone off the boat, I might write something like this. I might ask for first crew authorization because self-destruction is kind of a big deal. Let's make sure we have everyone's approval before we do it. Let's initiate self-destruct and let's get the heck off the boat. All right, so if I go take a b -b -b byte code break to see what this looks like and decompile, um, we'll see nothing, uh, too, wait, nothing too surprising at all. Hey, I have a lambda, and I have that familiar and weird null.instance, which means that I have a single instance of that lambda, which is getting invoked whenever I run this command. Cool, no big deal. All right, now, we probably want to give people a little bit of time to get off the boat before we you know, blow it up. So I actually have this seconds till parameter that is passed into my init self-destruct. What if I go ahead and actually let the computer know, hey, um, please wait a certain amount of seconds before you blow up the boat and so we can make sure everyone get, gets off the boat. Now, what does that do to the actual underlying Java bytecode? Well, oh my gosh. All right, there's a lot more going on here. There's basically a new function object being created each time. There's some scary sounding things like synthetic and bridge methods. And basically what's happening is because of the fact that I just reached out and grabbed that uh, outer variable in the environment, that kind of scoped value, I have changed it. It can no longer be a singleton. It has to be now created as an object each time I, you know, each time I, I call this function. And okay, in isolation, that might not be a bad thing, but if this is in you know, some kind of critical path or a loop just gets called all the time or just gets called all the time in general, it can add up. So something to be aware of, you know, obviously a lot of Kotlin is about writing uh, readable, you know, uh, reusable code, but something to be aware of is that there is a cost and if you are worried about performance, if you are on a critical path, this is something to be aware of. And it, again, it's just something as simple as reaching out and grabbing a scoped value. 
Okay. So there are some things though that you can do to kind of counteract uh, some of these penalties of lambdas, and that's through inlining. Uh, inlining is really neat. Inlining a function basically means in Kotlin that you take the body of that function and copy and paste it right into the, uh, to the call site. And you can actually inline higher order functions, and that copy and paste both the function body itself as long as the function body of any other kind of uh, function parameters or lambdas that you've passed in. And to see what that looks like, we're going to take a byte code break, and so I can show you what happens when you inline a function in Kotlin. All right, so this is a little bit different. We come out of space. We're working at a scary children's restaurant, kind of uh, something that reminds me of that restaurant that uh, starts with check and ends with cheese. Um, and it's kind of a scary job, a security guard. The like, animatronic, gosh, it's really frightening, are kind of scary. They are haunted. They kind of jump out at you, you at night. So it's not kind of like one of those security jobs where you get to snooze. You have to actually kind of uh, be conscious and uh, look out for things. So I might write a higher order function like this that will help me kind of work through my shift and figure out what I need to do to survive the night. And if I call that higher order function, it might look something like this, passing it a function literal where you know I clock in, close the doors, watch security camera, turn on the lights, make sure I kind of fight off these kind of scary animatronic things, and then clock out if I, if I manage to make it. Now, seeing what this looks like in the bytecode, we'll, we'll see not anything too surprising. In my main function, I call a uh, work shift, and again, there's a singleton instance of my uh, lambda that's getting called there. No big deal. All right, so what happens though, if we go ahead and make this higher order function that takes in uh, you know, that lambda uh, in line? So if we go back to the byte code, decompile, you can see that, oh, hey, so instead of just calling that function, it literally has taken you know, the body um, of my lambda and the body of this higher order function and copy and pasted it to where I'd called it inside of main. So this is one way to get past this problem with possibly allocating a lot of memory or just basically instantiating a lot of objects with lambdas. But as you can see, there's a lot more code there. And so there's a trade-off to using inline in that it can bloat your code, which leads to a whole set of problems. So again, like tools to help deal with things, but it's always going to depend on what your situation is and what you need. Something really interesting, though, about inline functions is that, remember how I said before that you cannot do non-local returns from lambdas because of, you know, oh, whatever, it doesn't exec execution context. You don't have to worry, actually worry about that in inline, func uh, inline functions because, and so say I do something like this. Uh, let me do something like this. Uh, let's see. Say inside of here, I want to say, wait, let me check the remaining battery um, because I need my flashlight, I need my door. If the battery is not over a certain amount, I'm just going to leave. Now, if this, was, this function wasn't in line, um, actually, it's in the block. Hold on. In the wrong place. So I actually can do, this is not the right place. It actually can do, I need to do it here. So here, if check remaining battery is less than 1.0, Okay, I'm going to return. Now, if the function was not inlined, I wouldn't be able to do this because, again, I don't know, you know, it's, you know, what return meant when this function was declared. But if it's inline, I can do that. And the reason that is is that because the code is literally being copy pasted to the call site, there's no ambiguity about where what this return refers to, right? It returns to here, the main function. So that's just another kind of nice thing about doing uh, inline uh, functions. Um, so there's some other interesting things about um, inlines. So if you, if you inline a higher order function, like I said, everything gets inlined. Everything gets kind of copy pasted. That does have some impacts though. Say I actually still wanted to kind of play around with my functions as values and pass them around. I can't do that in a higher order function that I've inlined like this. Because this kind of no longer exists as this like kind of discrete expression that I can pass around, I can't assign it. So what I can do though, is if I want to have my higher order function inline some of it, but still keep some functions around to be passed as expressions, I can use this no inline keyword to say, hey, this particular you know, function parameter, I want to be able to treat as an expression, so please don't inline it. And then I can actually later on store it, store it pass it around, uh, call it later, that kind of thing with no problem from the compiler. Um, and something to be aware of is that you know, even though I said you can do returns from inline, there's an exception to that as well. So say, let's look at this higher order function. Um, so one of these parameters body is actually getting inlined into a runnable. Okay, now we're getting in trouble because runnable 
runs things later, right? So we're running to that same um, situation where, hey, I might call return, and it might actually be returning in some other execution context that no longer exists. So that's what this cross inline is for. So if I didn't have cross inline here, uh, this error would go away in like the Lambda, but then I would get a, uh, an error up here saying, hey, I know that you can call this later, and you could possibly have a non-local return in here, so I'm not gonna let you do that. So if you're kind of in the situation and you wanna kind of have your cake and eat it too, you can specify a um, for parameter B cross inline. It allows you to inline that function into something like runnable that might get called later, but it does enforce that you cannot have non-local returns in that Lambda just for safety. So that's what that's for. It took me forever to figure out what cross inline was because it's kind of like it's not something that I know I run into every day. Um, something else interesting about inlining is reification. So in Java world, uh, probably some of us have tried really, really hard when you have generics to type check. And you know that because of the way that generics work in Java, the type information gets erased at compile time, and so you just don't have access to it. So you really couldn't do something like this. But with inline uh, functions in Kotlin and reification, you can. Now, if I don't have here, um, I see something like I would normally see, like say in Java, where, oh, I'm trying to check if this is this whatever type T that gets passed in. And it can't be because, it's, uh, because of type erasure. Uh, what happens is if I do re reified uh, into this uh, generic, because of the fact that, again, this function just gets copy pasted, it is known at um, compile time what that type is and it, the information is there. So you can do this type checking like this. Now, the reason that the reified exists is that because, or for the sake of Java interoperability, normal inline functions can be called from Java, they just aren't inlined. But to make this kind of type awareness, type checking work, the compiler has to do some things with a bytecode, and which is what reified is for. Reify basically lets the compiler know, hey, can you make this, um, can, can you kind of change things around so that you know, I can have that type information available, but that has kind of like the trade-off of making this inline function not callable from Java. So just to let you know. Um, and for the Android people, you're gonna see this a lot, like get system service, woo, one of my favorite uh, utility functions uh, is a uh, reified inline function. All right, real quick with a few minutes I have left, I'm just gonna breeze through a whole bunch of things that I love about Kotlin uh, in the standard lib and that you should definitely check out. Um, this is kind of one of my favorite things, one of my favorite stories about Kotlin is that when I first learned to Kotlin, there's this two operator and I kept trying to Google things about it, typing Kotlin operator two and I could never get search results, partly because two is a preposition and you know, you know, every, if you've ever tried to Google two, it's not a very fun experience. Um, but the reason I actually couldn't find it was because this is not an operator, it's not a reserved keyword, it's a function. And it's a function that you can call like this in this kind of interesting, you know, minus the dot and minus the parens because of infix. Infix is kind of a special class calling notation where if you have a one parameter method or function, you can, um, and you kind of mark it with infix, you can call it as if it's like another operator keyword. And if, you, if you've used down to, if you've used the shift right um, operator, they're not operators, they're functions. And this is something you can definitely use uh, in your own code. I, I know, uh, actually one of my teammates at work just used it. And it's, it's, okay, again, it's syntactic sugar, you might think it's silly, but at the same time, depending on what you're using, it might be helpful to write code in a more fluent way that is, makes something more understandable. In our case at work, we just, I think we had this, some kind of big like state machine and we were translating and transforming things and it was really confusing. We had some like chained arcs, Java, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end, we had this really nice infix, this kind of custom infix notation that very explicitly said, okay, you were turning this with this. And it was just a really nice kind of, again, readable way to kind of say, hey, here's the kind of return result and here's what, what it means. Um, again, providing more meaning and kind of readability possibly to the code. I'm sorry? Sure. If I, it's, um, I didn't actually show it. It's inside of this class member here. So it's a uh, member function with the infix notation on it. Sorry, trying to blast through. Um, just generally speaking, conventions are something really interesting in Kotlin and it's this idea that um, kind of unlike certain features in Java that you know, you can open up try with resources if you're using auto closables, or you can use, you know, four uh, colon syntax if you have an iterable. Um, those all depend on objects being a certain type. Conventions allow you to do certain things if you have uh, certain named functions. 
um, and I can't go through it and I love it. Uh, operator overloading works this way uh, in Kotlin. So does destructuring declarations. Uh, these are all things you should Google if you, if I don't have time, I'm sorry. Uh, delegates are great like that. Um, but I really wanted to take 40 seconds to talk about contracts. So contracts are this really great thing in 1.3 and I literally found them by clicking into apply with let and run and seeing these kind of weird contract things. So contracts are basically a way for you to kind of tell the compiler how something behaves. So this is, this is a, uh, um, oops, this is something that actually happened to me at work. I had a higher order function that allowed me to kind of pull out some initial values and I was trying to assign a val within this higher order function and I got these errors saying captured value initialization is forbidden due to possible reassignment and I was like, what is that? Um, basically what happens is the compiler can infer a lot, the Kotlin compiler is very smart, but what it's saying is, hey, you have this higher order function, how do I know that you're not going to call this function twice? basically violating kind of the idea that I'm going to be assigning my val once. That's why it doesn't like that. Um, with contracts though, really quick, I have no time left. If you're on 1.3, which everyone should be now because it's stable and out, um, you can instead do something like this, uh, contract only once, and I have to add all kinds of annotations because it's still in experiment mode. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, boop and my code now compiles. And basically, you know, there's this really cool contract that says, okay, compiler, I promise you that this block gets called once, so it allows you to do this value assignment. And again, I found this by just clicking into the code. So I encourage you all that are using Kotlin or haven't used Kotlin yet, but will soon, um, to do the same thing. Click through, like look at the open source, try to copy what Kotlin is doing, uh, riff on it, make, make, take your own spin on it, and so you can write your own sexy, interesting, uh, re hopefully more readable Kotlin constructs. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy the rest of GoTo.